Hey, Mike from Prep Pros here, and for those of you who don't already know me, I've been a full-time SAT tutor for over nine years. I've scored perfectly on the SAT myself. I've published what I know is by far the best digital SAT math book out there, and I had a ton of students crush it on the March digital SAT, so I know a thing or two about what it takes for you to have success on test day. So in this video, we're gonna cover 10 topics that you're absolutely gonna see on your May digital SAT. You're gonna learn some really important tips, tricks, and skills along the way to help you quickly improve your score and feel a lot more confident on test day. Now, the first thing you're definitely gonna see on your SAT are some very technical grammar questions. And anytime you see conventions of standard English, that's exactly what the SAT is testing you on. Now, the problem for most students is they just pick what sounds right or feels right, and the SAT is intentionally written to trip you up. So let's take a look at this one here. Now, since we're dealing with punctuation, we really don't need to read this sentence unless we want context. When it comes to their diets, goats are notoriously indiscriminate. Well, we have a full sentence or independent clause. Now, if we look after this, they will devour all kinds of shrubs and weeds, leaving virtually no part of any plant unconsumed. This gives us another independent clause and full sentence. Now, the only option which lets us join two full sentences together is gonna to be our colon. Now, most students are familiar that a colon can be used for listing items, but it also can be used if you have a independent clause before it and you see explanation, definition, clarification afterwards, and that it can include another independent clause. And that's exactly what's happening here. The second sentence is giving explanation about how they're notoriously indiscriminate, so that's where we can use the colon. Now, if you aren't familiar with like independent clauses and dependent clauses, don't worry about that. We're gonna cover that at the end of the video, so make sure you stick around till then, because that's one of our most important sets of grammar rules. Now, the next thing you're definitely gonna see on your SAT is unit conversion, but most likely not just any unit conversion, the one that trips almost all students up, which is square or cubed unit conversion. So as always, I recommend pausing the video and trying to work through the questions on your own before you watch me do them. Now, here we see a certain state park has an area of 32.8 square miles. What is the area in square yards of this state park? Now, the big mistake most students make is they'll do 32.8, and they'll do essentially just miles, and they'll put it over one. And then to use our conversion factor, one mile equals 1,760 yards. They'll do 1,760 yards over one mile, and it looks like their units are canceling out, and they end up getting the wrong answer here. But the really important thing to kind of catch with these questions is since it is square miles and we're converting into square yards, you always wanna put your mile squared and this means we have to square our conversion factor. If you are cubing it, you'll have to cube your conversion factor, but once you punch this into your calculator, you'll end up with our meters squared canceling out. And so you're doing 32.8 times 1,760 squared, and that will give you your correct answer of D. Now, the next thing you're definitely gonna see on your SAT are scale factor questions. And I actually heard from many of my students that this was one of the last questions they saw on the second harder math module. So it's really important that you memorize this table from my book here. So here we see the volume of rectangular solid X is 100 cubic units. The length, the width, and the height of the rectangular solid Y are three times the corresponding dimensions of rectangular solid X. What is the volume in cubic units of rectangular solid Y? Well, this is gonna be our scale factor. How many times greater any side length is, or any perimeter is, or circumference or radius is always gonna give you your scale factor. And if we understand our scale factor relationships, we can take this challenging question and make it very, very easy. So if we look down at our table here, we have a scale factor of three. Well, our volume multiple is gonna be equal to our scale factor cubed. So that tells us it's just going to be three cubed or 27 times greater. So finding the answer to this question, if we know these important scale factor rules, is as simple as 100 times 27, which is going to give us 2,700. If you're dealing with surface area, it's your scale factor squared, and area is also your scale factor squared. Now, one of the other things you will definitely see on your digital SAT are linear equations. And most of these can be done in Desmos if we understand some principles and some tricks. So this is a whopper of a question. A circle in the xy plane has its center at negative one comma one. Line t is tangent to this circle at the point five comma negative four. Which of the following points lies on line t? Well, what we need to understand from here, and that's why I picked this question, this is a really important principle as well, is if you have a line that is tangent to a circle, it is going to have a slope that is perpendicular from the center of the circle to that point of tangency. So we're gonna actually talk about how we can use Desmos to solve this entire question here. So first thing we're gonna do 
is we want to find the slope of the line from the center of the circle to the point of tangency, then we're going to take the perpendicular slope, which means we're going to flip the fraction and flip the sign, the negative reciprocal. So we're going to do negative 1 comma 1, and we're going to do 5 comma negative 4. Now we want Desmos to solve for just the slope, but we can always use Desmos to solve for a full equation of line if we do y1 tilde m x1 plus b. So our slope is negative 0 0.83333. So I'm just going to write that down here so we can keep it straight as we go through the rest of the question. Now from here, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to go ahead and remove those two points. And so Desmos can solve for the new line so we can figure out what point is on the new line. We're going to enter in that point 5 comma negative 4. Now, Desmos isn't going to kind of work properly unless we give it the slope if we only have one point. But we know the slope is the negative reciprocal of our original slope. Our original slope was negative 0 0.83333. So now we're just going to flip the sign. So it's going to become positive and we'll flip the fraction. So it's going to become 1 over 0 0.83333. Now this is going to give us the equation of our line. Now we want to figure out which of these points lies on line t. So as we go through, we can just use this really nice function. We can put in a point and we can see at 10 comma 2, we intersect that point. And that's how we can use Desmos to solve one of the most challenging lines questions you could see on your test. Now, the next thing you're going to see on your SAT are questions asking about no solution or infinite solutions. And here, if we see in the system of equations below, h is a constant. For what value of h does the system have no real solution? Well, we're looking at linear expressions here. There's no x squared term. So what we need to understand is if we have no real solution, that means we have parallel lines with different y-intercepts because they're never going to intersect each other. They're never going to have a solution. Now, this looks really messy and overwhelming. But one trick that makes these a lot easier is if we put linear equations in the form ax plus by equals c, if the ratio of a to b is the same in both equations, that tells us that they have the same slope, and that will let us solve for no solution. Now, I'm going to kind of pop up on the screen a page from my book, which is going to go into that a little bit more detail. Um, but that's a really important way that you can take these questions and make them way easier. So here, we just want to get both of these in ax plus by equals c form. So that means in my first equation, I'm going to subtract over the 96x. And in my second equation, I'm going to subtract over the 8y and add over the 109. Now, as we do that, that's going to give us negative 81x plus 36y equals 28. And that will give us 3hx minus 8y equals our negative 91. Now, all we have to do is set up this proportion. a is to b is a is to b. And remember, it's ax plus by equals c. So we're simply going to do negative 81 over 36 equals 3h over negative 8. And now from here, all we have to do is cross multiply. And once we do, we'll find our correct answer of h equals 6. Now, one of the next things you're going to see on your digital SAT are functions questions and very likely a function question around shifting. And Desmos does a fantastic job of making our life easy for these. So here we see the function below defines g of x. So we're just simply going to type in g of x equals 2 times 25x minus 15. Now, it also says, what is the y-coordinate of the y-intercept of g of x minus 3? We can actually simply just type this in and we get a new line. So I'd want to make my other one disappear. And then we can just go through, scroll down, we'll get that point of interest. And it makes your life really easy to solve the function question and find your correct answer of negative 180. Now, the next thing you're going to see on your SAT are completes the text questions. And for many students, these feel like some of the most difficult reading questions that they can see. Now, go ahead and pause the video, take a read through the passage, see if you can figure out your correct answer. Then we're going to break this back down together. Now, for completes the text, one of the biggest mistakes students make, and this is kind of a general reading principle, is they start adding a bunch of information that cannot be supported from the text. Although we are adding information here, we always have to be able to support our answer choices with information from the text. Now, the last sentence or two of completes the text questions essentially are going to function as a lens from which you can narrow down what you're really paying attention to in the rest of the passage. So here is our really important, what we can think of as essentially our lens as we go through. However, Kayer's team hasn't yet been able to determine the age of the creator. Therefore, the team suggests what? Well, this lens really helps me understand what I'm looking for as I go back. 
we're focused on the fact that they can't determine the age of the crater. So let's see how age relates to what we talked about in the rest of the passage. So we talked about the Younger Dryas was a period of extreme cooling from that period. Some scientists argue that a fragment hitting Earth brought about the cooling. Others disagree. This is our really important sentence here we're connecting back to, partly because there is no known crater from such an impact that dates to the beginning of the period. Now, we discovered this new crater, which some scientists think caused the claim, basically caused the Younger Dryas, but they can't determine the age of the crater. Therefore, we don't know if this crater actually is what caused the Younger Dryas because we need the dates to know if it actually occurred in this period. And that's exactly what A is saying. It can't be concluded that the impact that made the crater was connected to the beginning of the Younger Dryas because we don't know the age of the impact. Now, if we look at B, it can't be determined whether a comet fragment could make a crater as large as 19 miles wide. This could be true, but this has nothing to do with what's in the passage, and we're really restating the ideas in the passage for our completes the text questions here. It's not about whether a certain thing could create something so large. It's about understanding whether it occurred at the right time or not. Scientists have ignored the possibility that something other than cognate fragment could have made the crater. Same general issue there in C. The scientists who believe an impact caused the Younger Dryas have made an incorrect assumption about when the period began, we never have evidence of this in the passage. It's about not knowing when an impact occurred around it. That's why A is our correct answer. If you've been learning a lot in the video so far and you want to learn everything that you need to know to get a perfect score on the digital SAT from me, check out the free trial to my ultimate SAT course. It's going to give you a few hours of free content and we're going to teach you some of the most important foundational grammar rules and we're going to cover a math concept that shows up on every single SAT. It's also going to give you a feel for how the full Ultimate SAT course is going to work, which I think is by far the best online resource out there for helping students get really high scores on the SAT. It's also backed by a 100 point score improvement guarantee. So go ahead and check out that free trial now or at the end of the video. Now, one of the next things that I predict you're going to see on your digital SAT is the SAT playing defense against you just being able to simply plug in a ton of stuff into Desmos. And one of the most common places you're going to see this is with systems of equations. Now, if we have a really basic system of equations like x plus y equals 8 and x minus y equals 12, we can just graph these in Desmos and we can find our point of intersection. We're in and out of the question really easily. So Desmos is going to kind of block you from doing this by putting in a bunch of variables like we see here. If you see variables, you just want to substitute back in X and Y. If you get something really tricky like this, we simply can say A minus B is equal to X and C plus D is equal to Y. We can do this because we're solving for 2 at A minus 2B which is this really just no different than 2 times a minus b, which is also no different than 2 times x. So we're just going to rewrite this equation in a friendly way for Desmos, and we can take something really challenging and make it much easier for ourselves. So a minus b, we're just going to put in x, is a minus b we've decided is equal to x, plus 12 times c plus d, we're saying that's y, is equal to 589. And now we're going to have x plus 18y is equal to 1,251. Now we're looking for a minus b, which we defined as x. So we know it's negative 735. Since we're looking for 2a minus 2b, we're simply going to do 2 times negative 735, and that will give us our correct answer. Now another quadratic concept is going to block you from using Desmos. And this is questions about the discriminant. Anytime you see a quadratic, we have an x squared term, and it asks you about the number or type of solution, it's a discriminant question. So make sure you memorize this table from my book. Here we see in the quadratic equation below, z is a constant. For what value of z will the equation have one real solution? Well, we need b squared minus 4ac to equal 0 to have one real solution. So the first thing we need to do is it always needs to be an ax squared plus bx plus c form so we need to subtract over the 3. When we do that, we'll get zx squared plus 6x minus 3 is equal to 0. So our a value is z, our b value is 6, and our c value is negative 3. Now it's as simple as punching this into our formula. So we're going to get b squared, which is going to be 6 squared minus 4 times z times negative 3. And we're going to set that equal to 0. And as we solve through for that, we'll get our correct answer here of A. 
Now, the final thing you are 100% going to see on your digital SAT are sentence structure questions. These are on how to properly identify independent clauses, dependent clauses, and phrases, and the rules around how you can join those together. If you try to do these by ear, the SAT really will trip you up the majority of the time. On sunny days, dark rooftops absorb solar energy and convert it to unwanted heat, raising the surrounding air temperature. Well, up to there, we had an independent clause, so we have a full sentence or just really independent clause. Adding a light colored covering to an existing dark roof, either by attaching prefabricated reflective sheets or spraying on a paint like coating helps combat this effect. Well, we have another independent clause. The only answer choice that gives us a way of properly joining those two together is C, and that's how we can find the correct answer. Now, this is such an important rule set. This is the first thing I always teach my private tutoring students. But if you want to learn all the rules around this and how you can properly connect them and help you pick up some really easy questions to improve on on your digital SAT, check out the free trial to my ultimate SAT course. You're going to get in-depth lessons and a ton of practice around this concept. And you also can learn everything you need to know about systems of equations. Now, I really hope this video has helped you out. If you have any questions at all, drop them in the comments below. I'm going to talk about some resources that could help students in a few different scenarios. For all of you, at the bare minimum, I recommend checking out my free trial. There's no credit card needed. It's going to just teach you some really important foundational grammar rules and give you a lot more practice than I can give you in a YouTube format. Now, for those of you who are cramming, the first scenario we're going to cover, if you're feeling panicked and overwhelmed heading into the SAT, I strongly recommend checking out my crash course. It's designed exactly for that situation. It's designed to teach you the most commonly tested concepts and focus on the places where you can most easily improve your score when you're really short on time. Now, for those of you who are really just looking to improve your math score, the first thing I absolutely recommend doing is picking up a copy of my math book. It has a four level system, so depending on how you're scoring, it's going to let you know exactly what study guide you should follow and help you identify the places that you can improve your score as easily as possible. Now, for those of you who are already scoring in the high 600s or low 700s or even higher, and you're just really struggling on those most difficult questions at the end of the first module, and especially when we get that second harder module, there's two things I would recommend for you. Number one, Pick up a copy of my math book and go through the level three and level four study guides depending on your scoring range. And the other thing is in a few days, I'm gonna be dropping an advanced math course, which is really just focused around those most difficult questions. You can see at the very end of the first module and those last handful of questions on the second module where many students get completely stumped to help you feel comfortable with solving those varieties and understanding the concepts that can be tested in those locations.